So uh, welcome to the Paradise Center for the Arts second virtual artist talk. Um, today we're going to talk to Joe Krell, um, Jason Hillesheim from Bethlehem Academy. I will be talking about the um, PCA Gallery Committee show, and then we have Diane Lockerbie to talk about our PCA Instructors show. Uh, thank you for joining joining us. This is something new that we've been doing. Um, and it's trial and error. So thank you for joining us and uh, being understanding about that. Um, for you that um, aren't here in Faribault, the Paradise Center for the Arts is a multidisciplinary art center. We focus on the visual arts and performing arts mostly. Um, we have a auditorium for on-site on uh, galleries, our off-site healing arts gallery, our education spaces, and uh, we do rentals too. So uh, we're always busy at the Paradise and the pandemic has made us change some things and um, this is one of them. We wanted to get out the um, information about the artists if you couldn't come to the opening reception. And I think this is a great intimate way to do this. We will be recording this and putting it on YouTube and social media uh, for those who couldn't join us today. Um, and we have um, coming up first, we have Joe who is here to join us. And I have, I believe five slides for him. So Joe, um, let me know when you want me to go to the next slide and just tell us a little bit about your um, show and I guess your process. So uh, take it away, Joe. Okay. Well, thank you for, for setting this up. Um, the, uh, the world of the pandemic here, doing everything online. Uh, I grew up in Faribault, Minnesota. Uh, I would have been a teenager in the, the 80s and 90s. Um, I live up in Minneapolis now and I make, uh, make artwork down in my garage art studio. And uh, for the show, you know, I thought with it being in Faribault, my hometown, that for the, the theme of the show and for the artwork to, to create something that people from Faribault could connect with and, and recognize and, and have memories of, of things that they may have grew up seeing or knowing somebody that worked there. So my artwork features uh, landmarks and businesses and typography of, of different things that were in Faribault that I remember growing up. So whether it's the uh, Tilt-A-Whirl ride or the Farmer's Seed Company. Um, so I, I collected tons of uh, source material and then all of the artwork is handmade collage using uh, paper as the base layer from books and magazines and then adding uh, color with either spray paint or ink. And then for the final black layer, I do an image transfer. It's kind of like a screen print, but not quite perfect like that. It's a one-off. So all of the pieces in the show are all original handmade collages. Um, you can go to the next slide, I guess. I don't, I'm not sure what you have in here. Okay, this is a, a photo showing my process. So the, the larger wood panels have a, a art resin epoxy that I put on them to give it a, a clear finish and to, to finish it off and seal it. So up front there is Alexander Ferbo, the founder of Ferbo. Oh uh, yeah, you can go to the next one. And in the background, there's a, a map that was drawn out by Alexander Fairbo from 1855, I think. And then in the background, it was some, some ledger paper from an old ledger I have from Fairbo. So, is what is the next line? Uh, the creepy clown. So yeah, people either really like these or they think they're really creepy and they hate them. So uh, growing up, 
the tilt whirl you know, was a ride that would be at the county fair. And my dad had this sticker of this clown uh, in his shop growing up. And then I found out later he had a, a catalog from Selmer Manufacturing where you could order the clowns or the tilt a -whirl logo or the exit or enter. So I've always liked these clowns that they're kind of creepy and weird, but I think they're pretty cool. So we'll, we'll see if anybody buys them and hangs them up at their house. Otherwise, I guess they'll be hanging at my house. And there I am. <laughs> yeah, so there's a, you know, a collection of the work featuring different things from Fairbow. You know, the, the seven up was the, uh, the gray shingle was on the outer edge of Fairbow. Some flex beer. There's another creepy clown. Uh, in my research, I had found a couple pieces of Euro US currency that were printed in Fairbow. I think they were printed in Fairbow. They had the Fairbow logo on the money. So I had made a couple pieces featuring that. So, so that's that. I'm the cat. <laughs> All right. Anything else you're curious about? Uh, thank you, Joe. I just know um, a lot of people, especially that live in Faribault, grew up in Faribault, um, said it's like taking a trip down memory lane, um, very nostalgic. And yep. um, for us who have only been in Faribault 25 years, it was great to hear about businesses that are no longer in business. And um, my understanding is um, one of your, your family owned one of the businesses, somebody told me. Yep, my dad owns the Hardwood General Store down by the King Mill Dam. So there's a, a piece in the show that is just a photo of his, his shop and he collects uh, antique stoves and antique clocks and Frank Zappa and anything old and cool. So I, I just took a photo just of how his whole setup is and made that into our piece. And, and Basilio's, they bought their piece or the piece, yeah. I guess. Yeah, yeah, I worked at Basilio's in high school. That was my one job, making pizzas back in the day. Um, and I, I'm glad that the uh, new owners purchased it and reopened it again. You know, it's always been a, a favorite when I go back to town to stop in and get pizza. So that was cool that they bought it. I, I, went, I went there last weekend or the weekend before and they had it hanging up over in their dining area. So that was cool. Well, that's amazing. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. Um, and all the work um, or the, the uh, work we're talking about today will be up through April 3rd. And the Paradise is open currently Thursday and Friday, noon to five and Saturdays, 10 a.m. to two. If those times don't work for you, please give us a call or an email and we'll set up an appointment so you can get in and see the artwork. Um, Joe has 99 pieces in the gallery right now. He had 100, but um, Basilio's has their piece. Um, so plenty of options to purchase Joe's work. And um, what's really nice about Joe's work is he's got several, several different levels of um, pricing for his work. So it's very affordable. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, thank you. Next, we have Bethlehem Academy and we have um, their um, amazing instructor, Jason Hillesheim with us, who can tell us about uh, the work in the Coraline Krieger Memorial Gallery. And Jason, how many artists do we have in there right now? Uh, I wanna say that for this show, there's is there 17? Wow. I think that there's seven. I'm pretty sure that I think there's 17. One, two, three, four, five. Because there's five here. There's, yeah, I think there's 17 altogether for this one. So it's a good mix of, of, of um, you know, it's, we have this way of doing our eclectic collections of different mediums and where we're at. 
the kids are just busy and that's what's phenomenal in the classroom. They come in and we're just, you know, kind of the Chuck Close, some of my students know the, the quote pretty well. We watched this piece on Chuck Close, note to self. And he makes a statement, he says, inspiration is for amateurs. The rest of us just get to work. And, you know, so we'll say that, say, you know, we just need to get to work because we don't know if we're going to be here tomorrow with, we've been fortunate enough to be in class um, at Bethlehem Academy, um, in person teaching uh, since September for basically 98% of the time. Um, but we never know if there's a spike with the uh, pandemic that the next day we could be distance learning and then learning from home. So we've really learned to take advantage of the time when you're in lab and working to be number one, having fun. Number two, making a mess. Number three, continue to have fun and create great things. And that's just, just to keep it moving and keep working. And yeah, so um, yeah, this group of five pieces here on the front wall, um, <clears throat> we've got three canvas, acrylic on canvas pieces that were from first semester. Um, and it's basically the students had some options of choosing a personal subject matter that they enjoyed, which is on the far right, um, Sammy Hanker's piece, the, the yellow, the reds, the blues. She chose some imagery from, I believe it was uh, Arizona or Utah from a family trip and through the rocks and the arches and you can kind of see those rocks. So that's what she formed that on. Um, Tegan Farron's piece, uh, she's a new student at BA, first year that I've had her. She chose to do a Monet study piece, that's Sunset at Venice. And she just changed it up as the ideas were they, they were allowed to use red, yellow, and blue, and that's it. And then they have to mix all their secondaries, their tertiaries, um, complementaries, um, and go through that process of being self-sustainable to mix their own colors. And then they can do whatever they want. Uh, two portrait pieces. This is the year of the mask. So I believe that every class that I had, basically every drawing class and middle school class, they all did a self-portrait with the mask for second semester. I just thought first semester, we didn't do the mask. This semester, I thought, let's just, we're going to do the mask because hopefully by next year, we won't have to be wearing them. And they can look back and say, man, remember we had to wear those every day? everywhere we went <laughs> so some of the kids had some fun with them and they were allowed to uh to use color pencil uh watercolor collage any elements they wanted to or just you continue to use graphite so those portraits are graphite on paper we use the grid method you know i'm a big chuck close nut and i really you know we, we go back that that grid method it's ancient classical artists used it um all the way back to the Egyptians. So it's, it's not cheating, it's just a method. Um, so yeah, and then the dot painting. I don't know what dot means, um, but I was assured that it's nothing that my generation would misunderstand that it's something bad. The student just said, I just like the word dot. So I'm, I'm trusting that it's not a subliminal thing to the new generation that it means something. So he just said, it's just the word dot. And he was looking at Andy Warhol and Jasper John's pieces and he's like, yeah, I'm going to try to do a little pop art and throw the word in there and see what happens in some colors. So, yeah, it's just investigating and exploring. Yeah, we can go to the next slide. Now we've got our intarsia. We've had a new uh, instructor at Bethlehem Academy, Miss Cassie Story, and she's our agriculture teacher as well. We have a new greenhouse at BA that was donated. So they built a greenhouse out back. So they're working hard on ag. She also does the intarsia work and the wood shop work as well. So these are some of the, I just said, bring me what you got for intarsia pieces and let's, let's get them up there and show these. And some of the students, the tulips and the flower pieces, uh, like Jaden Lang and uh, I can't remember who made the tulips. Uh, Caitlin Trump, I believe. Um, they're like, really, you're going to put those up, Mr. Hillis? I was like, yeah, yeah, we're going to put them up. I think they're great. You know, they're good visual pieces. Um, you worked hard at it. People should see them. Yeah. And the golf piece, that's a, that's a beautiful piece there. And uh, yeah, Braden did a nice job on that. And he's a golfer, actually, uh, the student that did that. He went to state two years ago. And he's, yeah, he's a good, he's, he's a golfer and an artist. So that's a good thing. Um, just kind of looking at the piece. We have some 
ceramic pieces in there as well, some watercolor study pieces. And the, the watercolor, I, I like to do the watercolor and ink where we just watercolor and ink everything. I'm not a purist with watercolor. When I teach it, I tell the students that. And I always admire looking at Jeff Jarvis's pieces online. And so I'll show some of Jeff's work in the classroom too and say, hey, here's a friend of mine and here's what he's doing. And they're like, hey, we're doing, yeah. And I'm just like, if you can model it, they really like his use of, of the soft colors. So I, I kind of, Jeff probably doesn't know this. I, I haven't talked to him, but I'll show that stuff in the classroom to inspire them. Say, here's what local artists are doing and that gets them to see differently and not just look at things, but to really see and notice the details all around them with color and shape and form and allowing things to just move along as they work through it. So yeah, let me go to the next one. There we go, School of Fish, right? Those are, yeah. No, the Intarsia program's just fantastic. I. I I love that some of the students, they, you know, they'll say, well, Mr. Hillisheim, sorry, I didn't take a class with you. You know, they're in their senior year. And I'll say, but you work three years in the wood shop. Your intarsia pieces are beautiful. And they're like, well, and I said, it's art. It, it doesn't matter if you're in, you know, choir, band, drama, theater, uh, intarsia, painting, drawing, studio arts. As long as you're using, you know, doing something for yourself to see what you can create. To challenge yourself so it's always beautiful to have those pieces in there and we've got uh, luke bowers um he's a harry potter uh fanatic he had a couple of pieces at our last show this is actually our fourth show this year right julie four along with the halloween because we participate at the halloween in a normal year we do two shows uh, in the krieger gallery this year during the pandemic you'd think it'd be slower we actually have done it four shows. So, you know, that's Trent and Michelle. We're so grateful for this space. And, um, but yeah, he hand carved these, uh, the, all the wands. I think the top one is Harry's wand in there. The, uh, the elder wand is the second from the top. And I just watched uh, the Half Blood Prince the other day when it was snowing, got in from shovel and I thought I'd watch Harry Potter. I thought of these wands. Um, and then, uh, down below, we've got a hand-built airplane by Carson Hazelton. Um, and we work together. He, the students, you know, they'll come up to the art room and they'll walk in when I'm teaching a painting class or a drawing class. And they'll say, hey, Mr. Hillisheim, sorry to interrupt. Can I get some paint? And if they've had classes with me before, they know where everything is. So I'm just like, you know where everything is? Yep. So they go get their brushes, they get their paints, they get their palettes. And then they come back and wash everything up. So it's a nice bridging between our departments that, you, you know, it's all about the sharing and feeling of ownership when they come in the classroom. I always tell the kids, this isn't my room, it's your room. So just take care of things, know where it's at, have that independence. And I love it when they get independent like that and just come in and ask for permission. They can do everything on their own. That's a great achievement. I always love that when the kids come in and feel that it's their home, their home place to use. All right, and the next. And this piece is uh, Minneapolis Skyline, uh, Avery Han. She's one of our foreign exchange students from South Korea. She's a senior this year. I've had the pleasure and honor of having her as a student for the last couple of years. Um, very meticulous. She had, a, she had a portrait piece down there for the last show of Sister Mary Margaret that was very wonderful ultra-realism piece that she did in graphite. And this is nice because this one you can flip upside down. So she put the, you know, we're looking at it. And I always have the kids turn their work around and say, okay, let's see what it looks like sideways. Let's see what it looks like upside down. And when she flipped it upside down, she's like, oh, because I think it was supposed to be the other way around with the black silhouette of the buildings. And then she decided to leave it this way <laughs> and then just label it on both sides so you can hang it either way you want. Um, so, oh, there's my phone. Uh, yeah, so that was a great piece. Very fun. Is, I think, is that the last one? That's the last one, yeah. And then, I, and, I, and then Joe, I wanted to add, I'm, I've got this blank space right here. This is where my piece of Joe Crawl is going. So right. you only have 98 pieces left because one of those, Basilio's took theirs, I left mine. So yeah. I'm looking forward to having it right at this space right here. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jason. 
And, and, and sorry we didn't have any of the students join in. It, it just got really, it was end of quarter three last week and <clears throat> things just kind of, we were just trying to finish up the quarter, get finals and things done and the communications. A lot of kids are out and about and they're up north at grandma and grandpa's or out doing something outside and they're busy. So it's, I told them not to worry about it. And yeah, so I'm they're glad. for themselves. Yeah, I'm glad that they can get out and do something enjoyable. Yes, exactly. Very talented students. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Let's see. You. Next, we have the PCA instructors. Um, the Paradise has, a, sorry, I have a cat helping me and a dog. Um, the PCA has a second floor dedicated to classrooms. We have a beautiful pottery studio, a couple general classrooms. Come on, oh boy. Um, and a batik lab and a small arts library. We also have a lovely rehearsal space in the basement and of course our beautiful auditorium. Um, so the PCA instructors are in the hy V gallery right now, trying to promote or promoting um, our classes this spring and coming up this summer. So we have a full line. Um, we have everything from needle felting, batik, pottery, painting, drawing, uh, new this year, we have um, oh, Carol is going to do a t-shirt uh, quilt class for us. Um, and we have all kinds of virtual classes happening um, from Kate Lingla. And I've got Diane Lockerbie here to talk about um, her work. And she is our instructor who's teaching um, our pottery for us and basically runs the pottery department for us. And Diane, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your work? Okay, my work started long, long, long ago, more years than I care to talk about. But I took my first class at the Paradise. Well, it wasn't the Paradise, it was a Faribault Art Center then. And it actually was the last class the Art Center was holding in the basement of what is now the old security bank building. And then we moved to down the street um, from Dusick's Bakery, which was around then, and below the basement of Grandia's um, Hobby Store, which is currently the AA building. And then years later, we moved across the street to what was used to be the old Mahal, or Mahler's building. And we had that building for a number of years. And then we finally said, and, moved down, took over the old Paradise Theater, which became the Paradise Center for the Arts. So I've been involved in it for a long time, enjoyed every minute of it, enjoy making clay. I, like I said, I got my first start, first class started there. And now I'm ending up teaching and loving every minute of it. I've had kids from the age of four up to people in their late eighties taking hand building or clay classes. And this summer we'll, I have one week of classes coming up the middle of June and we'll see what age group we can get in at that time too. But um, most people remark that it is very relaxing. Um, I've done, uh, this is what the, uh, those are both birdhouses. They um, actually are what I call my, part of my COVID projects. I had seen bird, ceramic birdhouses, the birds will enter and exit through the mouth um, before and always said to be really, really, really neat. And uh, so I had extra time on my hands last spring and I thought, doggone it, I'm gonna do it. The dog is actually my English setter, um, Fisher. I've also done my golden retriever and stuff. The bunny rabbit is the bunny rabbit and stuff. Um, they literally can go outside. They have been fired to 2,100 degrees. So they're weather, weather perfect, weather safe. Um, all my pieces that I do make are completely food safe, um, can be used as everyday wear. As I say, I like to keep my prices low so that should a piece break, um, the people are gonna say, oh goodness, it was so reasonable, I'll go back and buy another one. In fact, I had a phone call from a gal about 10 days ago her cat had knocked a part. I had a two piece piece that she bought and it, she broke one of the pieces. So she, she says she wants it replaced. So I'm going, she said, and she said it was so reasonably priced that uh, 
she was going to get have it replaced and get a couple f- for friends. But uh, I do it for it's good therapy. It's relaxing. I love to share it with my knowledge with everybody. Um, we have Tuesday morning studios that we run. We're always upstairs in the studio on Tuesday mornings from 10 until 12. Um, from September through March and this year, maybe even go into April and May between 10 and 12. And we always, it's whether you're involved in clay or if it's a first time, if you're curious, come on up the, we don't use the main doors because it's closed, but we come in the door to the right and up the steps to the right of the main entrance. Just come on upstairs, come in, you'll see what we're doing. We have all sorts of ages involved and abilities, um, all sorts of different different types of, of interests and stuff. And we'll get you started if you're curious or just stop in and see what we're doing with stuff. It's, uh, it's great fun, good therapy. And we make stuff to put on the walls, to put on the floor for your animals, to uh, eat out of yourself, to give as gifts. But number one, it's relaxing and it's fun. And if you want to try it, we'll find something that you'll like and stuff. That show that we have there is encompassing everybody that is teaching classes at the Paradise this summer and stuff. So you can come in and see what what things are available. Most of the classes are for all age levels. Oops, there we are. That's our Raku that we do once or twice a year and stuff um, with a normal clay piece. We put it in the cat. Put your glazed piece into the kiln. It takes about eight or 10 hours, about 10 to 12 hours for it to come to temperature, about 36 hours for the kiln to cool so that we can take your pieces out and you can handle them and take them home. With this Raku, what we end up doing is we take our glaze. This is a, a gas kiln where our other kiln is electric, but um, it has a big blow torch that comes in the side. Um, we take your glazed pieces with a specific glaze for this temperature. We put the pieces in the kiln, close the door up, light up the big torch. And like I mentioned, the 12 hour um, firing to get to temperature in this one, we can do it in less than an hour and a half and stuff. Um, it comes up to temperature. Then we turn the big torch off. Um, slowly open the door, stand back to let the heat blast come out. And then as you'll see, I've got big heavy gloves on. I've got big heavy tongs. We reach in there with that tong and um, lift your pieces out one by one. At the base of the picture, you're gonna see two little garbage cans, one with the flames coming out because it's already got a super hot piece in there that's lit all the combustibles. Um, so we take the pieces out, we put them in the bucket um, once we get a couple pieces in the bucket, we stick, um, by that time they're burning fiercely, we put a tight lid on the top of it so that it reduces it to smoke and stuff. And the smoky atmosphere causes what we call reduction where the, um, the fire searches for oxygen and actually takes the oxygen from the chemical glaze makeup. But if we do it right, we get some specific, uh, some really, really neat um, iridescent um, kind of, for the person that knows what they're doing, it's predictable colors. <laughs> but for us, we don't do it that often that it is like Christmas time. When we finally open up that bucket with, it may this time in the bucket, they may be cool for half hour, 45 minutes at most. And then we, using the heavy gloves, we take the pieces out and we clean them up. You can see on the right behind me there, you can see some pieces that are waiting to go in the kiln um, to, to get their color. But the whole process from the time we close the door until we take it of the kiln, until we take it out of the bucket is maybe about two hours. And so you can walk home with your piece the same day. Sometimes we have a piece that we kind of go, whoops. Don't know what happened to that. Occasionally we'll have a piece break, but these are all decorative pieces. These are my fish that uh, came out of the Raku um, firing. The two 
kind of on the upper left of the piece have some of the iridescent Raku glazes. They didn't turn out really, really colorful. You can see the smokiness and on the, the two little fish down in the front, kind of the, the yellows and the oranges, where you see the black, that is caused by the smoke, by the fire and stuff. Wherever there is not glaze, it's going to turn smoky if we have a good fire in there and stuff. So there's a whole bunch. It's We're always curious to see what we can get out of there and stuff. Uh, we're doing another of these of this type of firing the mid of May, middle of May. Um, if anybody wants to join us, you can call and get information. It requires a specific type of clay um, for Raku that can withstand the shock of going from 1850 degrees into a bucket and dropping down to a couple hundred degrees in a half hour and stuff. But um, so they're truly decorative. They are not to be used with food but they sure are fun to make. It's uh, like we say, if you're, if you're into pottery, you should give it a try at least once, it's fun. Diane has even gotten me into clay and I <laughs> never thought I, I would like clay. Um, I've even bought a kiln, um, I, I love it. And the Raku process is my favorite. So I highly recommend it. And all of our classes right now are on our website. So take a look at that and call us or um, give me an email, stop in, and we can get you registered for those classes. Okay, thank you, Diane. Um, just a wide variety of things you can do with clay. It's amazing. Um, and Judy, do you have anything to say? Judy Say Willis is with us and she is going to teach some natural dyeing classes this summer. Um, we've got an indigo vat coming up April 24th and some natural dyeing classes later in the summer. And one is uh, focused all around marigolds. Um, I love the smell of marigolds. You want to say, any, say anything, Judy, or you're good? You're muted. Judy. Let's see. There. Does that work? Yes. yes. Yay. Okay. The, um, the, the piece that's in the show in the gallery was, was a piece that was done for a group show. And it basically was to show um, that I think the title of it was what we leave underneath of our feet. Um, and one side had linen fabric and another side had polyester fabric. And I tried, you know, lighting both sides of it. So that, you could see that one deteriorates, one would, would compost out, and the other one just melts into plastic. But that, that aside, the um, indigo vat this summer is a little bit like what Diane was talking about with Raku and reduction. It's kind of interesting. Reduction seems to have be this creative process in different art forms. Um, and reduction makes indigo work. Indigo is the blue color that uh, originally Levi Strauss used, so they always say indigo is the color that made Levi Strauss famous. Um, I, I, grew, um, I grew indigo locally last summer and the summer before. Um, I, I will be growing it again this year. I just haven't gotten an, a location nailed down. And many of the, the flowers that we use and the plants that we use in the natural dye classes are locally sourced, you know, so I, I like to uh, at least provide the information for people to know what you can get color from. A lot of the wood shavers locally um, will give me all their wood shavings. T Tom Teller has given me some mesquite. I have, a, I have probably a two decade supply of mesquite wood shavings um, and you get some beautiful colors uh, from the wood shavings. Many, um, you know, there's a lot of local local plants and the indigo, um, yeah, the, in, the um, community indigo vat was an idea I had a year ago. It was one way that people could get out and do something with, with COVID because the way we set it up, we set it up so there's two people every, every 45 minutes. We can, you know, upstairs in the textile lab, we can maintain social distancing, you know, with two or three people very easily. And uh, so people can prepare 
something or they got a t-shirt or something they want to want to try dyeing in the indigo vat they can bring it in and and dye it i i'll be putting up on my website um, a tutorial for basic shibori technique so if people want to do say a t-shirt or some napkins or towels um, with some of the shibori techniques they can go to my website and view the tutorial and and possibly use some of those techniques you know, and at another time, we'll be teaching more comprehensive shibori techniques. But there's 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 a lot of color locally. Um, you know, we she mentioned marigolds. There is a class. The class will be taking marigolds, pot full of marigolds, and we'll we'll simmer them and get a, a colored a bat of colored liquid is really what it is. We're going to divide that into three parts. And the one part we'll use for dyeing whatever whatever they want to dye, whether it's a scarf or some napkins. Um, and then the next pot we'll be making we'll be using that to make inks. Um, I've been using I've been making a lot of inks from locally sourced uh, dye materials. And uh, then the third one will be we'll be working on making pigment and that would be made into watercolors or you can make your oil paints or other things out of it with the with the inks when I teach an ink class which we talked about doing um, I'll also show people how to make a pop can pen for that you can use for calligraphy and I really like that pen because I don't have a real good hand you know I to, to writing or drawing or anything like that. So this pop can pen works really great for me. So I'm going to be teaching that in the ink classes and we haven't scheduled those yet. So I think that's about it, isn't it? <laughs> Judy, what's your website if people are interested? What's, what's the name of your website? Is it Judy Saywillis.com? Oh, yeah, saywillis.com. Um, Saywillis with a hyphen. It's um, Dan Engvall, who is, you know, your, your the pottery department is quite familiar with Diane, is working on my website. Now it's in transition right now. So we're, we're um, I'm working on producing the tutorials tomorrow. So okay. hopefully in a week, those will be able to be up on the website. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hey. No, that's mine, Julie. Oh, well. Quiet. And everybody's dogs went off at the same time. Okay, thank you, Judy. You're welcome. Oh, next we have up the gallery committee show in memory of our gallery committee member, Linda Van Leer. Um, Linda was a lifelong, I believe, a Faribault native. She um, painted a lot of local buildings, a lot of, I'm so sorry, local scenes. Um, she, Charlie, not listening. Um, she would uh, winter in Texas and she made jewelry down there and she would teach. Um, she was on our gallery committee well over 15 years. Uh, we really miss her. So we did this group show in her honor um, just to celebrate her. Um, and you can see in this photo, the Farm and Seed Building, um, the sweet spot uh, when it was downtown, a lot of uh, local icons. Let's see here. And so what we did is the gallery committee, we brought in pieces that reminded us of Linda um, or pieces that we made in uh, memory of Linda. So on the left here, we have Kate Langley. Am I well, on the right? left here, we have Kate Langley. Oh no, why am, I, why am I making an echo? Um, and then on the right here, we have two of Maggie Gale's watercolors. And the um, one in the center here recently sold. So that is exciting. And this photo, we have two of Linda's pieces. On the very left, it's a Tuscan scene. Um, right next to that is um, our gallery committee member, uh, Dee Teller, who's in Texas right now. Um, next is the Baccarat Building by Linda. Um, amazing piece. Um, really enjoy that one. Of course, that's what we see across the street from the Paradise. 
And then we have another uh, D Teller and D Teller and Linda were um, actually neighbors. There's a better look at those two pieces. Very, a lot of Faribault scenes. Um, here's more of Kate's work. And I see Kate's on the call. Kate, do you wanna tell us a little bit about your work? And um, Kate has been teaching a lot of virtual classes for us. Uh, we're very fortunate um, to have her doing that. Um, and they are free to Minnesota residents. So if you're interested, um, Kate has classes first through sixth grade and uh, seventh through adult. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you basically covered, covered everything then. Yeah, there, uh, and we also have some uh, some funding to do a few free ones this summer too. Um, so stay tuned for those. Uh, those will be up on the Paradise website soon. So yeah, they're, they've been great though. Like we've gotten a lot of new students who haven't taken classes at the Paradise before. So that's that's really the goal of the getting the funding to get, get more students here at the Paradise, even virtually. And hopefully we'll have some in-person classes someday soon too. And you're doing a bunch of um, birthday parties for famous artists. Yeah, yeah, those are really fun. We just like have our classes and we do a, a painting in the style of a, of a famous artist. So we have a, a Van Gogh one coming up who is one of my favorite artists. Um, and we'll do our, our own version of Starry Night. Oh, there's Charlie. <laughs> The troublemaker. <laughs> I think we have another Kate, uh, another piece of yours. Whoops. Uh, this is Char and Audrey. Char is teaching needle felting at the Paradise. Audrey's been again addicted to ceramics, like some of the rest of us. Diane's got us all into pottery. And here's another um, portrait Kate did on the left. Um, Bob Dylan, and I believe Kate's grandma went to school with Bob Dylan. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she went to high school with him. I think she was in a different class than him, but um, but yeah, she has a lot of memories of Bob Dylan playing piano at the talent shows and I think nearly breaking the pianos because he played it so passionately. Um, so because he started his songwriting on piano and then then moved to guitar later on. So. So cool to have that connection. Yeah. Um, in the center there is my only landscape painting. Um, a bunch of us went out to Morristown in 2010 that summer and did a lot of plein air painting. And I believe Linda was with us. Um, that's why I picked that piece. Um, on the right here, we have Deb Johnson. Deb Johnson was the head of the gallery committee for 15 years before I became the head of it and I've been there 10 years. Um, so Deb is doing um, some acrylic pouring. She will have a show at the Paradise this summer and I'm trying to teach her into, um, um, trying to talk her into teaching um, acrylic pouring for us. So we'll see um, if she'll do that for us. Oh yeah, I've had a student say that they are interested in the, the acrylic pouring and, uh, and I've never, yeah, that would be awesome to point them to one of her classes if she teaches that. Yeah. And we have um, the area student show on the second floor. It is a little small this year, but um, COVID, you know, has thrown us some um, curveballs. But we do have the Fairbowl Middle School, um, Bethlehem Academy, um, some of Kate's um, students, and then also the Area Learning Center um, has brought in a couple pieces recently. So the pieces you see right now are the um, Fairbowl Middle School. And I can see a couple um, pieces that some of our um, students did that uh, take other classes uh, at the Paradise. So that's really exciting. Um, and this is one of Kate's students. This is Stacy, um, And she'll have a show in the Krieger Gallery coming up this summer. She is very excited to be taking Kate's classes. I think she signed up for almost all the multi-day classes uh, with Kate. Um, 
looks like some famous um, people to me, some great uh, uh, graphite drawings. Uh, this is Freya, another student of Kate's. Uh, Kate does a class called Painting Minnesota. So this is our state tree and our state bird. I believe they also did some famous musicians and one of our famous um, cartoon artists, um, Charles Schultz, you know, Snoopy. Yeah, had to get him in there. And then here is, uh, is this Hazel the Great, I believe? Um, yeah, this yeah, is a <laughs> She calls herself Hazel the Great. Um, uh, when she logs in, I think I think it's wonderful. And this is a family portrait of hers. Um, very exciting to have the student artwork, and it's so um, amazing to see how inspired they are. And um, sign up for our classes. Go to our website. Um, come and see the galleries. Uh, we will have a couple of performances coming up. Um, April 9th, we have a show in the auditorium, The Old Country Boys, with some special guests. Uh, we have Walter Salas Hamara, uh, the lead singer of the Silos, uh, May 21st. So we're slowly getting uh, things back into the auditorium, which will increase our activity, of course, in the galleries. But I'm so um, um, indebted, um, thrilled to, um, to have the visual arts and the education department to keep the paradise going um, in this time of the pandemic. And it's the first time that the visual arts have been focused on since I've started at the paradise. So I hate to say it took a pandemic to do that, but I am um, very excited that that's happening. And of course, we'd like to thank the Minnesota State Arts Board. Um, we uh, get funding from them on a regular basis for operating grants and other programs like Arts Access um, and the um, creative um, money for the organizations uh, during the pandemic. And we also have theater camps coming up, Acting Fund for Little Ones, ages four to seven, starting mid-April. At the end of July, we have Beauty and the Beast Junior. Um, Rachel Heider will be teaching that. She has got her um, vaccinations and she is excited to get back on stage with um, a live cast. Um, thank you, Diane Lockerbie, Jason Hillesheim, Joe Krell, Judy Say Willis, and Kate Langley. Um, couldn't do it without you guys. And um, we, will we are recording this and we'll put it on YouTube and the social media outlets um, for those who did not get to see it today. So tell your friends and family to check it out. And I think if anybody's got any questions, we could do that now. Any, anything anybody else wants to say? I think if we're all good, we can um, say good night and enjoy this um, sunset. I can see it out my window. Thank you guys, I really mean it. Um, I'm so excited and happy to work at the Paradise and be involved with all of you artists. Have a great evening. Thank you, Julie. 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 Bye bye. Thank you.